as mentioned, I'm going to give you all a short introduction to the materials learning algorithm, a Python package for, um, for materials modeling. Uh, this is all still a work in progress. So we're currently developing and applying this, this package to different problems. Um, so this is not a finished software project yet. Um, just as a, a reminder, because throughout my talk at several points, I'm going to talk more about what we are going to do or what planning to do and not so much about results. Um, and as mentioned already, this is a joint effort by, by CASUS, by the Sundia National Laboratories, where this, where this idea sort of started with Attila and his old group there, and at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, before I go into, into more detail, maybe uh, I'm going to give you a little motivation um, why we are um, concerned with this problem. And the overall goal here is multi-scale materials modeling. So we're interested in modeling materials across several lengths and time scales. So both on microscopic scales to both um, predict or model materials accurately at these microscopic scales, as well as being able to model these materials on macroscopic scales. Um, so in this context, microscopic means nanometers and tens of seconds, macroscopic scales in the ranges of millimeters and milliseconds. And having tools that would allow us to do so uh, is important for advanced science applications. For example, the discovery of new materials for fusion reactor walls and, and similar applications for the understanding of phenomena like the planetary formation or the um, for the control of microstructure and advanced manufacturing. Um, the problem is that uh, doing this multi-scale modeling is challenging because it requires the combination of multiple simulation methods with um, their respective problems or limitations. And what, so what would be the general idea is to um, combine well-established simulation methods that exist on the various scales. Um, so, for example, we have microscopic methods that um, can be used to simulate extended systems, but lack the accuracy to describe a system on smaller scales and can therefore not be used on their own. And there also exist microscopic methods that are more accurate, but fail to unfavorably to be used on these larger extended systems. And our goal would then be to have such a multi-scale modeling method that um, would, us, would allow us to sort of have the best of both worlds here. And the state of the art approach, this is the combination of uh, two methods, for example, or you know, for example, the state of the art approach here is um, to use a classical mechanical simulation and that models the physical movement of atoms or molecules. And this is usually done with molecular dynamics a method that solves the classical equations of motion. And this is then combined with a quantum mechanical simulation that calculates the forces acting upon these atoms or molecules. And the usual or the most popular method here is density functional theory, DFT, that calculates the electronic structure of atoms. This leads to um, something like this. We have this classical mechanic simulation, mechanic simulation that um, that uses atomic forces to calculate new atomic positions that are then the input for a DFT calculation. And DFT can, based on these atomic positions, calculate atomic forces. And the time step is performed in this MD part here. And using such a loop, a certain system can be simulated for a certain amount of, amount of simulated time. Um, and this is sort of something that can already be done. They exist well-established um, methods and, and codes for, for both parts, for DFT and MD. But the problem is that for reasons that I'm going to explain shortly, DFT cannot be applied to these larger extended or more complicated systems that we are interested in. I'm not gonna really go into detail on the MD part. In the context of this work, you can just assume MD is something that works, that we have well-established codes for. Um, our problem is in the field of the DFT, DFT and the quantum mechanical part of this multi-scale approach. Uh, and to, to show you what's the problem with DFT and why an, an, 
approach like Mahler is necessary, I'm going to start with, uh, with the electronic structure theory and the exact framework of what we're actually trying to achieve. In this, in this uh, context of what we're looking at, we have the system consisting of Ne electrons at collective positions R underscore and Ni ions at capital R underscore that are governed by a Schrodinger equation for, and this is valid for um, temperature zero Kelvin. So we would ha have to solve this Schrodinger equation. That's an eigenvalue equation with an Hamilton operator and energy eigenvalues and this wave function. Um, we work within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which means that we assume that the positions of the ions are fixed and their movements happen on time scales that are larger, way larger than the electronic time scale, which is why this Hamiltonian only includes kinetic energies for the electrons, but then interactions for all the particles. So electron-electron interaction, electron-ion interaction, and ion-ion interaction. And for um, zero Kelvin, this would be the exact equation that we would have to solve in order to properly describe a system. We're also very interested or mostly interested in systems with non-zero temperature. And in this So it looks like Lenz went offline. So let's give him a few minutes and maybe he can reconnect. Hello, am I back? Hi, Lance. Yeah, I think you went offline uh, just uh, yeah. a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, I've had an internet internet problem. Um, what was the last thing that that I that was visible that you people heard me say? You were at the um, finer temperature uh, slide, so on a slide with the Schrodinger equation. And okay. you were just starting to talk about the grand potential. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I will just take it. I will just take it from there. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for, for that. I, I maybe can be can be spotty at times. So okay. Uh yes, uh, as I was mentioning, we have to we have to move from the Schrodinger equation to this grand canonical ensemble for um, systems at temperatures that are above zero Kelvin, which is what we're generally interested in, especially in the context of matter under extreme conditions. And we have to here not only take into account the Hamiltonian, but also the entropy operator um, and the particle number operator with the chemical potential here. Um, and this is all a very brief overview of the larger exact framework. But what I just wanted to give an impression of is that um, these are the exact equations that one would have to think about, but they cannot be solved explicitly. They uh, result in insecurable equations that res um, come with a huge computational dem demand that um, scales with the order of three to the power of NE. And this is 
unfeasible even for small systems and calls for approximations. And the most popular approximation in this context is density function theory, or one of the most popular approximations. Um, density function theory, the central variable becomes the electronic density, n of r. This is given by the hohenberg cohen theorem. And this electronic density uh, is now defined at each point in a real space grid or, or in real space. Uh, so this R here is not the R underscore that are the collective positions of multiple electrons. This is just one position in 3D space. So already at this point, you can guess that it's a reduction, a drastical reduction in storage size needed for these approaches. And the electronic density is, can be uh, inter interpreted as a probability density of finding an electron at a certain point in space. And this is the, the central aspect of DFT. Practically, the calculations within DFT are often done or are generally done by an auxiliary system of non-interacting electrons. So the problem that we would be looking at is an interacting a problem of interacting electrons. And to um, treat that computationally, we assume an auxiliary system of non-interacting electrons that are restricted to reproduce the density of the interacting system. This results in a system of one interacting F1 electron equations given here. They're often called Kuhn-Charm equations. They are Schrodinger equations for one electron with a kinetic energy term and an effective potential, resulting in these energy eigenvalues that are in this case now temperature dependent because we uh, move to, um, to temperatures that are to higher temperatures, temperatures um, that are not zero Kelvin. And using these uh, one electron wave functions, also sometimes referred to as cone charm wave functions or cone charm orbitals, we can calculate the electronic density via this equation. This F here is the Fermi Dirac distribution, uh, which we need to include here again because of the temperature that we're looking at. Um, and this system is then solved self consistently, meaning that such this. Uh, uh, such a system is solved for the wave functions and the density can be calculated and afterwards drawing on the density and and the calculations that can be done here this effective potential is updated and all of this is done iteratively until the correct ground state density is identified and this is sort of the, what drives density functional theory within dft all quantities can be calculated as a function of the density and if we can calculate the correct ground state density. Then we have access to a lot of other quantities. And the most important one is the total free energy. And this is also often generally uh, one of the quantities that we use to stop this self-consistent iteration. We uh, want to identify the ground state energy. Um, and this energy functional, we have different contributions. We have the kinetic energy of the, oh, by the way, can you can you see my, my mouse? Yes, I can see that. Oh. Yeah, great. Um, so we uh, have the kinetic energy of non-interacting system, the entropy of non-interacting system, um, the interaction of the electrons with the ions, of the ions with each other, the electrostatic interaction of the electrons, and then the exchange correlation energy. And the exchange correlation energy is where a lot of the beauty of DFT comes into play because uh, DFT is kept theoretically exact by this exchange correlation energy, meaning that all of the other terms, there exist analytical expressions for them that are correct within or exact within certain approximations. And the errors introduced by these approximations or simply by these approaches are all in theory, absorbed into the exchange correlation energy. So if we were to know the exact exchange correlation energy functional, we could, uh, DFT would give us the correct ground state or correct energy in general. Um, in practice, we don't know this exchange correlation functional and we have to approximate it. But by doing so and by choosing this approach, the quality of DFT of the DFT calculations and the predictions that it does depends solely on the on this exchange correlation 
functional. And by choosing an appropriate approximation for a certain problem, we can produce results. Uh, we can produce meaningful results that are helpful for whatever we are looking at. And there exists a plethora of, of these approximations. Some are more suited for certain problems than others. And that's one of the things that one has to keep in mind when doing DFT that this has to be approximated in a, in a reasonable way. Um, uh, but the problem is that even with all these nice approximations and these sophisticated uh, programming, uh, sophisticated programs and codes that exist for DFT, DFT is still too expensive. It still scales with an order of NE to the power of three, which is unfavorable or not good enough for a lot of the practical problems that we're looking at. And this is now where DFT surrogates come into play and MALA that I'm that I want to uh, present to you is one of these DFT surrogates. And the idea here is simply to replace DFT with the machine learning model trained on DFT data. So the concept is quite simple, I think. We perform DFT calculations for a set of atomic positions uh, with some sort of target quantity, train a surrogate model with it, and then can access the same information as we would from a DFT calculation at a fraction of the cost. So, Computational cost is drastically decreased, and also the scaling behavior is generally generally way more favorable than DFT. Although it depends on the on the approach, so I cannot make a umbrella statement here. Um, there exist different algorithms uh, to realize such a surrogate model. MALA currently uses artificial feedforward neural networks, but in theory, other machine learning techniques could be could be employed here as well. And as we are using artificial feed forward neural networks or neural networks in general, I'm going to give a short overview of what a neural network is. I know that a lot of you work with neural networks on a daily basis or have a strong background um, in the field, but I'm still going to give a short overview of what it is so that we're all sort of on the same page, at least in the context of this presentation. Um, a neural network, as the name would suggest, is a network that consists of artificial neurons. A neural network is capable of approximating, at least in theory, any function f of x equals y. To do so, each neuron weighs, sums, and biases input. So we have some sort of input that is weighted, summed up, bias is added, and then an activation function is subjected to it. Uh, to give a little bit more graphic, graphical explanation for that, just a very, very small neural network with five neurons, one output neuron, two input neurons, two hidden neurons that are connected here via these weights. The thickness of the lines here um, correspond to the magnitude that, that this weight would have and uh, how much these nodes are filled um, is also corresponding to the magnitude of the values and uh, we can see that we have two input neurons here. One has a larger value than the other one. And they're connected to these hidden neurons. And now we pass the data, this input data, through the network by multiplying these input values with the weights and adding in a bias here. And we can see that here the input value is larger and we use a large weight. So this results in larger values here than compared to this uh, neuron. But here the bias is smaller than here. Then some sort of activation function is applied to this um, to these values, and um, we get a new value. This activation functions can be um, or are usually things like sigmoid functions, 10h functions, or um, some sort of linear activations. And then we have new output values that um, serve as input for the next layer of neurons, where the whole procedure is repeated. Um, and in doing so, and doing this for a lot of neurons, because usually neural networks are, are really, really large. This is just a very small example. Normally we have multiple layers. We have hundreds and thousands of neurons, millions of connections. We can, in theory, approximate any function. I'm not going to give the proof now. You just kind of have to believe me here. Um, but it works. And this, of course, only works if the weights and biases are tuned and are correct. So after each data pass, we have to adjust them with uh, respect to the 
error of the output. This is called training. So in the training, we have some sort of input data that we know the output for, and then let the network make its prediction. And the error between what the network thinks the output should be and what the output actually is, we use that to adjust the weights and the biases. And this is called, sorry, okay. And this is called um, neck propagation. And in doing so, we eventually end up with a network that is able to perform any kind of approximation or, or mapping that we train it on. So in the context of, of this, this presentation, you can think of a network of a new network as a way to approximate a function or to learn a certain mapping. And now the question has to be asked, which mapping sh should such a DFT surrogate then perform? One of the first ideas that would come to mind as well, we want to have access to the forces or the derivatives of the total energy and maybe the total energy itself. And we know the atomic position, so that's the mapping that we should learn. And there exist approaches that do that. For example, the deep MD code. Um, some of the problems here is that these codes are restricted to only the energy. And it has been shown or some investigations suggest that there are some problems with the accuracy, especially for more complicated um, applications here. Uh, so we would probably, it would be a good idea to think a little bit further of what other mappings would be possible. And another idea that comes to mind is to learn the density. Because I already mentioned that everything is a function of the density. If we would were to know the density from the atomic positions through this mapping, we could use DFT and the standard algorithms there to predict the total energy, the derivations, and also other quantities that are that can be expressed as a function of the density. The problem here is that um, everything is a function of the density except for the things that are not. Uh, the total energy equation that I've shown you earlier is correct, but in practice, the kinetic energy and the entropy of non-interacting systems are not really expressed in terms of the density, but are calculated using the system of auxiliary one electron wave function. So in order to, to do such, such a workflow here, we would have to learn a mapping for these quantities based on the density as well. And this can be challenging, first of all, because we would have to train multiple machine learning models. And um, second of all, it is, has been shown that it that is, leads to some problems with the gradients, which then again would be problematic because we are interested in the forces of the gradients. And this now um, leads to what Mahler is uh, attempting to do. In Mahler, the local density of states is learned, d of epsilon and r. Um, it's an energy and spatially resolved target quantity that can be used by a post-processing step to calculate the total energy, the derivatives of the total energy, and all the other quantities that were accessible through the density. Um, of course, now the question is, what is the local density of states? The local density of states is the density of states at each point in real space and the density of states, DOS, measures how many states are occupied by the system at a certain energy level. And given here is the density of states for three different systems, aluminum and iron, both liquid and solid. And we can see that for different energy levels, um, we get information on how many states are occupied at this, at this energy. And this is the, the density of states given here. So integrated over the entire uh, entire real space of the simulation cell. And the local density of states, the elders would be a similar uh, image, but at each grid point. And we can see that the sort of energy spectrum that the um, bus is gives us information on the system. And we can clearly see that it behaves quite differently for, for different systems. We can see that there are clear differences between liquid and, and solid iron, for example. And MANA is modeled around this LDOS. The idea is to learn this LDOS and then calculate every quantity of interest using this LDOS. So um, uh, we can use the LDOS to calculate both density of and the density of states using these integrations, whether we integrate it over the 
real space grid or the energy grid, we get the density and the density of states. And using density and density of states, we can then calculate the total energy. Some of the expressions are dependent on the density. I've already mentioned that a couple of slides um, back. And the entropy and the band energy, which is um, another expression for the kinetic energy, or this is the, the kinetic energy can be approximated using this band energy or expressed uh, in, in terms of that. We uh, can calculate these quantities using the density of states. Um, and this can be that can be done analytically. These are the equations for that. And so having the local density of state, we have access to the total energy through the system of equation. And this is essentially what um, Mala is supposed to do or what Mala does. Learn models or train models that predict the local density of states for systems of interest and then access the total energy or other quantities like the density or the density of states through post-processing. This leads to a very general workflow that I'm sure is quite similar to a lot of other workflows for surrogate modeling, where we have to uh, think about data generation, pre-processing data, train and train networks and perform inference, and then post-process the results. Um, MALA is a Python package, as I already mentioned. It is supposed to be modular by design at every step so that different open source codes can be used as well and different um, calculation or processing techniques can be applied. Um, and it's of course supposed to be powered by open source software codes that do all the heavy lifting for us. The first thing that we have to think about is data generation. In principle, every DFT, actually every electronic structure code that exports the elders can be used with MALA. A data generation can be challenging for the applications that we look at because we have to perform DFT calculation at high temperatures or high pressures or generally extreme conditions, which can be challenging. There exists some sort of discretization error between the density and the uh, local density of states. So when uh, calculating the total energy via the density and the density, local density of states, some errors are introduced and they should be as small as possible. And the DFT calculations parameters have to be adjusted so that they are, because a model is not really worth much if it learns a mapping based on data that is already kind of inaccurate. And we have to make sure that the uh, data that we learn, or that we train on is sufficiently smooth to, um, to help sort of make the training easier. Currently, MALA is optimized for the quantum espresso code. So all the interfaces are written to quantum espresso, but as I said, in general, in general other open source DFT codes could be applied here as well. A quick word about what I meant with the smoothness of the local density of state. Um, this is the density of states for uh, ion, at the solid, solid ion at 3000 Kelvin, and for three different levels of DFT calculations. So I haven't talked much about the technical aspects of DFT, but there exists something called K points or K grids that one has to specify when doing a DFT calculation. And very, uh, well, very way, um, simple way to think about it is that the more K points we use for DFT calculation, the more accurate the result is, but the more computationally expensive the DFT calculation becomes. And one would be interested in using as few K points as possible while still having uh, the desired accuracy. And so when doing a DFT calculation, normally uh, one performs successive DFT calculations with an increasing number of K points until a number of K points is identified that is, um, that for example, calculates the energy at a su sufficient accuracy. Um, and here are the density of states for three different amounts of K points, three different K grids. And I should mention that for all of these, the total energy uh, is sufficiently accurate enough. So when just looking at the total energy, there would be no reason not to use the 512 K point grid. But when looking at the density of states and looking at the oscillations that we can see here that are unphysical in nature, we see that we have to move to higher K-point grids. So here, the green curve still shows some oscillation, but 
with the lower magnitude in order to have a sufficiently smooth DOS, even though just from the DFT calculation itself, there would be no need to do that. So this is something that we need to think about when going with such a workflow that the normal DFT calculation would not be concerned with. Um, and that also makes the initial DFT calculations for trading data, data generation more expensive. After having generated data, we need to pre-process the data. Some of this is pretty standard stuff. We need to perform some sort of scaling or and also convert the units of the data. Um, and the elder data that is outputted by the uh, DFT code, we have to pass that somehow into our code. Um, uh, well, what we also have to do is we have to encode the structural information of the atomic positions on the grid. So the local density of states is given per grid point. The positions of the atoms is not given per grid point. We have to do that by choosing some sort of descriptors that describe the local neighborhood of grid points. Um, these descriptors have to be invariant to atomic operations, such as translation, rotation, or permutation of atoms. They have to be continuously differentiable. And what um, is currently used in MALA are the snap descriptors uh, accessible through the LAMPS code. Um, in theory, uh, a lot of other descriptors exist. I mean, in practice, they exist. And in theory, they would be possible to use with MALA. And by um, using LAMPS or having an interface to LAMPS, it is not that hard to also make MALA uh, compatible with these other descriptors because in LAMPS there already exists implementation for a lot of other descriptors that fulfill these, uh, these constraints. A um, little uh, example or visualization of how this is done, this sort of descriptor generation. Here we have a 2D grid. In practice, we would have the 3D grid. And then the atomic density is calculated around a certain grid point in this case. This grid point, but of course, this is done for each grid point by using a, a distance around the grid point and then calculating the atomic density within um, this specified distance and then guaranteeing the necessary invariances by expanding the atomic density in hyperspherical harmonic functions. And in doing so, we get appropriate descriptors that we can use to um, as an input data for the target data, the elders. And afterwards, we have, for example, for a simulation that uses 8 million grid points, 8 million real space grid points, we have 8 million data points, 8 million pairs of input data, descriptors, and elders, because the elders also exist or has a value at each, a value vector actually at each grid point. And this is then the data that we use to train um, models. And these models are built using PyTorch. Currently, MALA is um, uh, only uh, using feedforward neural networks. But in theory, everything could be used that PyTorch supports, which is a lot, as those of you who work with PyTorch are well aware of. Um, we use Hoverbo to enable the training on multiple GPUs. And we perform hyperparameter optimization via Optuna. Hyperparameters are the parameters that describe the architecture of network as well as the training. So um, for example, uh, how many layers there are, how many neurons there are per layer, or how such a back propagation that I was talking about earlier is performed. All of this, all of these are hyperparameters and this is done via the library Optuna. Although we also include novel approaches to this hyperparameter optimization, such as orthogonal arrays and training free hyperparameter optimization in MALA. Um, after having trained the model and being able to perform inference on it, all the important quantities are then derived from the predicted LDOS. Um, for this, some integration has to be performed, which can be done via standard methods of numerical integration or analytically. Um, so for the band energy and the entropy, there exist analytical formulas that I've shown you. And uh, here analytical integration can be also performed in, in MALA. Um, the density 
based um, calculations are then done by interfacing a DFT code, quantum espresso in this case. Um, and the only problem at the moment is that the forces that I've already established are quite, quite important for this uh, MD workflow are not yet available. So mathematically they are available, but they are not currently implemented in MALA. This is sort of the work in progress that I was talking about earlier. This is what we're working on, or one of the things that we are working on. And with this, I want to talk a little bit about the results and the ongoing project with MALA. Um, so the first results are from the proof of concept a research article by Attila and his old group at the National Laboratories that used sort of a pre mala so the same um, the same uh, ideas, the same algorithms, um, but not yet in the form of this Python package that is now being developed by Casos, uh, the Sandia National Laboratories in Oak Ridge. And um, this workflow was uh, used to investigate an aluminum system with 256 atoms at the room temperature and the melting point of aluminum. And here at the melting point, both liquid and solid configurations were used. Um, Good agreement of machine learning predictions and DFT calculations were found. For example, here, um, this, these are the results of training and then testing a model using the data at room temperature, one atomic configuration, so the, the, the data on the grid of one atomic configuration, and then testing it on multiple atomic configurations and the overall mean absolute error with. Um, it's very small with about two milli electron volts per atom. Uh, the overall goal would be something in the, with something below 10 milli electron volts per atom. For the 933 Kelvin, the results depended um, heavily on the trading data, data selection, which is as expected. So when, for example here, when training a model on only liquid atomic configuration, configurations, it will fail to um, predict solid atomic configurations, which can be seen that this model here predicts the solid atomic configurations with a significantly higher error than what I've shown before of 426 milli electron volts per atom because it was only trained on liquid data. But when training models that um, incorporate liquid and solid training data, for example, um, mean absolute errors can be Achieved that are uh, almost at the at the uh, and this this um, limitation that I've talked about of 10 milli electron volts per atom or this goal that we would want to achieve. Uh, and so this this uh, research article illustrates how this workflow is a powerful tool that can be used to build these surrogate models, and is sort of the basis for MALA and the further investigations done by MALA. Uh, here another visualization of what I was just mentioning with the training data selection here for the band energy, not the total energy. Uh, in, in black, you can see the target values and then in, in purple and blue, the respective solid and liquid predictions. And as one would expect, um, the models only trained on solid prediction, uh, solid data fail to predict liquid atomic configurations and vice versa. This is what we would intuitively expect, but it's um, and still, I think a very important result to um, to verify that this is also the case, and that we therefore have to think about training data selection carefully when building such a model. Um, the, uh, now coming a little bit to the work in progress using Mala. What I'm currently uh, investing a lot of time in is the is a project where uh, we look at the identification of efficient data generation techniques. So. What I mean by that is the question, can we train on data from smaller or easier simulations, but then use the model to replace an extended simulation? So um, what we would want, for example, is to have a DFT, uh, do a DFT calculation on a, on a fine real space grid, but instead of training on data with the same real space grid, we would use training data that was calculated using a coarser grid. This makes the training data generation easier and cheaper, but if possible, the surrogate model would still have the same accuracy as 
calculations with the um, within this case the finer grid would have. Another uh, good example of what we what that would mean would be the number of atoms, for example, having to uh, only train or being able to train the network on calculations that were done by using, for example, 16 atoms, but then making predictions for systems that consist of 128 atoms or even more. And if we were able to do that, we could drastically decrease the time we need to generate training, training data, make this ta task overall easier. Um, and so this is, I think, a very interesting subject to look into, especially given that Mala works on a per grid point basis. So Mala is sort of um, indifferent to, for example, the number of atoms that were used to generate training data, and uh, which is a promising approach here. And another uh, thing that is interesting to mention in this case is temperature. So the DFT calculation have to be done at a certain temperature. We have to specify that that's an user input. And the uh, question here would be, is it possible to, for example, train a model on a certain temperature, but then use this model with some level of success for other temperatures as well, in order to be able not to have to train a new model for each new temperature that we're interested in. And with this, I'm almost at the end of my talk. Um, I'm going to give you a little outlook of what is what are going to be the next steps with, with Mala. Um, we're looking, of course, always to integrate even more open source software capabilities. So what I mean is interfaces to new codes and other DFT codes, for example, of, to have uh, better post-processing capabilities or uh, solve technical issues. Um, we're always interested in making the code usable and having a clear API so that it is easy for other people to use it as well, um, especially then when integrating it with MD software for which the force calculation is still missing, which is one of the big ongoing projects at the moment. Uh, and in terms of applications, we're looking to apply MALA to earth core conditions, so iron with, um, with carbon under the appropriate uh, pressures and temperatures. And we're also looking into investigating the uh, novel hyperparameter optimization techniques in MALA, so orthogonal array tuning and the training free hyperparameter optimization. And of course, what would be interested, interesting is the identification of optimal network architectures. So currently we're only using feed forward neural networks, but there exists a lot and a lot of different neural network architectures. And it would be interesting to see what else could be helpful in this context. And especially uh, one project that uh, is worth mentioning here is active learning, which is what uh, Steve, Steve Schmeller that Attila already mentioned is looking into and one of the newly joined uh, student researchers. Zoom is also looking into this. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. As already mentioned by Attila, Mala is out on GitHub soon. You can already uh, look at the, the group. The group Mala project is already online and very soon we will have the code there. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, please feel free to ask.